Hi folks, thanks to be here for this talk about zero downtime deployment on Kubernetes. I'm Nicola Frankel, I've been a developer for 20 years, recently I also became a developer advocate. And I wrote this talk because we live in interesting times and I believe this is an interesting topic. The first question is, why should we do zero downtime? I mean, for a long time, we lived without zero downtime at all. When you wanted to deploy a new version of your application, you just uh, switched the proxy to a static page, then you did your deployment, it took as long as necessary, and then you switched your proxy back on to the real site. I believe there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that the business wants it. Actually, in some industries, downtime has a direct cost. Imagine you are running an e-commerce shop. Well, every time, every, every time your uh, site is down, you are not selling and customers are going to your competitors. That's not so good. But even if you don't have direct consequences, if your site is down, customers or users will probably notice. And the longer the downtime, the less trust they will have in your site and they will go somewhere else. The second reason is that in this day and age, people, users, people who are not working in IT, are expecting zero downtime. In fact, that's the opposite. They are not expecting that your application or your site might be down. And when they want, they go to Google, when they go to Facebook, when they go to Amazon, the site is always up. And hence, if you present them with a static page, they won't understand the reason. And again, they will go to somebody else. The reason So the ID, uh, one of the oldest trick in the book, is to have blue-green deployment. With blue-green deployment, you have two complete different environments that mirror each other. And then in front, you have an, a big a load balancer, a proxy, and your user are directed to one version of the site. In general, the initial version is blue. And then at some point, you want to deploy your new application, then you deploy everything on green. Meanwhile, your users still continue to use the blue environment and everything is fine. After you have finished deployment, then you just push, push a big button and then you direct your users to the new green environment. And it seems pretty magical. And even better, Kubernetes comes with the concept of rolling updates. So you have different pods, so it's not only one single server, uh, but there are multiple pods. And then you just like have several pods in a single deployment. And then you say, hey, I want to switch to a new version. And depending how you configure it, uh, Kubernetes will roll out new versions of your pod. And it seems to be pretty easy. Uh, and that's actually where most uh, talks end. It, you have rolling updates in Kubernetes, everything is magical. But the problem is it doesn't address the biggest problem. And the biggest problem is states. And you have different kinds of states. In general, the main ones are sessions and databases. I believe that the state in session has been solved already for a long, long time through session replication. The state that is in session has already been addressed because actually when you've got a load balancer and you've got several nodes and one of them might fail, uh, even though you have a session uh, affinity, then you want your user to keep the state of their cards, for example. And for that reason, we invented session replication. So when, whenever you do a change in the session of a user, it's replicated throughout all other nodes. 
that seems quite straightforward. But the problem is the database. Notice that in the previous diagram, I've shown you like two different databases. The problem is what you have two different databases, then you probably need at some point to migrate your data. If you've got a couple of lines of data to migrate, that's fine. If you've got millions of lines of data to migrate, that's not so fine. So in general, you go to a variant of the Bagoon deployment and you have a single database. And I will go through both options, single database and different database. And I will show you that in general, you probably want to go for option two. So first let's discuss option one. We will keep the same databases. And um, the problem in that case is at some point, you will probably need to do a change of the schema. That means that your application needs to cope with two different versions of your database schema. And now comes the really hard part of Kubernetes is we've got this rolling upgrade. And now it's not only about having application pods, but we also have uh, a DE pod and it also needs to be upgraded at what point? Well, let's see. So imagine that uh, we've got version one and version two. We start uh, rolling out the application to version two and we want to database also to handle version two. But that, at this point, if we roll out version two of the database schema, the old pods, they won't work anymore and it's an issue. So the idea is, okay, that's fine, that's easy. We will just like deploy the latest version of the schema when all pods have done their migration and it's pretty same approach. However, we forgot something. Like, in general, when you do deployment, you don't expect that you need to roll back. But the probability of having to roll back because of some issues is not zero. Um, and you always need to prepare for this occurrence. So if we do the same as before, and we just like deploy the new version of the schema when all pods have been deployed, well, it works if there is no rollback. So here, version of 2.0 of the application can cope with schema 1.0. Now we can deploy the version 2.0 of database, but now we cannot roll back. If at any point we need to roll back, it's not possible anymore. We cannot roll back the schema change because actually it's not compatible and uh, we cannot roll back a single node. So <laughs> that means that every time we do a deployment, we must be sure that it will be completely correct. And that's not really how li real life works, actually. Let's see how it works in practice. Um, I have this e-commerce use case because uh, I've worked in e-commerce before and uh, in general, it talks to people. So imagine I have designed my application very easily. I have a customer and the customer has uh, different cart lines and every cart line has a single product. That's how I, can, I, I could have designed my first e-commerce shop. But now our business comes to us and say, mm -hmm, false, we have noticed there are many people who put stuff in their cards and in the end, they don't go to, to check out. So what we, what we would like to do is we keep track of the cards when they were last updated. And if they don't go to the checkout after 24 hours, we will send them a kind reminder that hey, you've put this item and this item and this item in your cart and you didn't buy. So perhaps you need a little incentive. So let's say, hey, you've got 20% of discount on, on your cart. This is, this is something that a business might come up with. Now we've got a new schema designed. So we introduce this cart here, this cart uh, table. So now a customer has a cart, a cart has multiple cart lines, and this is not change. And this is a breaking change. So if we want to deploy a new version of this application with a new version of the schema, it won't be possible. Well, it won't be possible directly. Actually, we can try to be smart 
and try to split this change. So instead of having one huge breaking change, as I've shown, we can have different small non-breaking change, or let's say changes that are compatible side by side. So two steps is not possible, but step by step it's possible to uh, deploy and then roll back. Because again, rollback in generally is a good occurrence to keep in mind. There might be times that deployment won't be successful. So with this example in mind, here is something that I've come up with. The first step is, of course, we create the cards table and the app still uses the old data model directly, the connection between a customer and its cart lines. But now, every time we do change, then we get the cart and we add the cart lines also to the cart, not only to the customer. And however you do the uh, replication, you trigger that. It can be regular triggers in the database, it can be the application. That, that's not important. The important part here is how you address this issue. So the, the old schema is still the source of truth, but you copy the data and the relationship to the new schema. Now at this point, if you need to roll back, everything is fine. You just add additional data, but the old schema is still the source of truth. The second step is you keep doing the same, but now your application uses the card as a source of truth. And every time you do a change, on the cards, you replicate it to the customer. So the application changes the source of truth, but if you need to go back in time to, to roll back, you can roll back to step one. And because we've replicated everything, again, through triggers, through the application, whatever, then we still haven't lost any data. The third step is actually the problem. This works well, what I've shown you works well, if we have data that is touched, if customers are actually uh, using the cards. But imagine that we do the deployment and during this deployment, there are lots of cards that are still there and they won't be triggered, they won't be handled, they won't be replicated. So we need to move those cards to the new data model as well. And finally, we do some cleanup. And the issue there is that those cards, they can represent a lot of data. And that means we'll need to migrate data anyway. So if we keep the same databases, there are lots of cons in my opinion. The first is we need to do the steps decomposition. So for every breaking change, we need to find the right steps to decompose so that we can roll back. We can roll back a single step. We cannot roll back two steps at once. It won't be, it won't be working at all. Then we need to plan because all the things that we are doing right now, they impact different parts of the organizations. They impact the developers because the developers need their application to be compatible with version one and version two of the schema, they impact DBAs, they impact DevOps. So everybody is impacted. And here I've shown you how it works with one single change. Now imagine if it worked, if you need to have different changes working in parallel, if you deploy multiple changes parallel, it will be a mess. And I think the last nail in the coffin is that you will need to migrate data anyway. As I mentioned, you will need to migrate the data that was not touched. That's a lot of cons. So let's see the option two, meaning we only have one, uh, like we have two, two databases, two, two separate databases. And the issue was, hey, that's a lot of issues to migrate the data because we can have lots of and lots of data to migrate. But well, we need to migrate some of it, most of it anyway. So, okay, let's see how we can cope with that. Well, we can cope with that by having something called change data capture. I will uh, have a slide dedicated to it afterwards. And imagine if we have two different databases 
then everybody is independent. That's not an issue. And of course, it can work with any deployment strategy, it can be canary lilies, it can be blue green, it can be anything you want. So about change data capture, this is what uh, Wikipedia says about change data capture. The idea is, I won't read it to you, but the idea, you might be uh, familiar with the idea of even sourcing. The idea behind even sourcing is that actually you will not store state, but you will store events. Uh, and then when you want to get the state, you will replay all the events to aggregate them to the final state. And because you might have lots and lots and lots of events, then probably you will take some snapshots, so you will get the latest snapshot plus add the additional events uh, and, and play them on top of the latest snapshot. That's really good, that's nice, but it needs, um, if you have a legacy application, then your application needs to de redesign completely how it stores its state or its events or <laughs> call it however you want. Um, with change data capture, we, it's the exact opposite. We keep our legacy application, we keep the storage of the real state, but every time we change the state, we will create an event out of it. And there are multiple uh, implementations, of course. For example, in the past, if you have added a column in your table with a flag, with a last updated column, with whatever, and then you run a batch at regular interval, that change this flag or this list updated column. And I, 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 you have a conditional that say, hey, if I didn't do this before, then I do this. And then you change the flag. Then this is the first step in change data capture. We will use something else in the demo, which is called Debezium, but the, the ID is still the same. So now how does it translate it into a real a deployment with Kubernetes. Imagine I still have my three pods, I still have my database, now everything is a pod. I have, this is the initial state, the, the original state. And now, step by step, how do we approach that? So the first thing is we will create, if it doesn't exist, the green database. And now the green database has a completely separate schema. It can be non-compatible. That's not an issue. We don't care that much. The next step is to actually create a data streaming that will capture the changes from whatever happens in the blue database, transform it according to the new schema and push it to the new database. So here there is Arrow just means that we are listening to changes and we will be writing here. So here we are not writing, we are just like getting the, the, the data. The arrow means it. this component is the active one. The database doesn't do nothing. So now every time a user gets on any pods and change something in their own schema, then every time the change will be pushed to the new database and transform according to the new schema. Now we can start our rolling update and the good thing is that the user, the user that comes and gets on a new version of the pod will get to the green database but since the green database is now up to date for this user with everything from the new database then it's as if the user, well, hits the blue database for the, for the user, it's completely transparent. And so all pods are now upgraded like this in a rolling way, and now it works, but it's a bit more involved than just saying, hey, we have pods and we have a rolling upgrade, because all the underlying infrastructure that contains the state needs also to be uh, designed. At some point, all the pods will have migrated to uh, version 2, so that actually there is no more data coming in, like no more data read by the forward job and return to the uh, green database. So it might be time to stop the job. 
And then you can do whatever you want with the blue database. You can keep it for auditing. Here, what I um, didn't do because I'm pretty lazy, I must admit, is I didn't uh, have any backward job. So here I only add a forward job, but I could have also had a backward job just again in case you need to roll back. It's really good. So how do we implement it? Here is, uh, I'm working for Hazel costs. Um, so here is how we can do it with Hazel costs. This is just not the only way to do it, but this is uh, the way I will demo it to you. So Hazel costs is actually an in-memory technology that has both a storage port, you can store stuff in memory, and you can also do data streaming. The idea is uh, from that for data streaming, you have a couple of sources, uh, one of them being database events, and here we will uh, use CDC, and then we can do the transformation. You can also, it's fully distributed. So if you need like to scale it, it, it won't be an issue. And then we can like push the transform data from the database to the database another one so from the green to the blue and uh, regarding session replication we will store the session in memory so in the demo i will use uh, the spring integration because uh, you can just do like straightforward session replication but i'm using a spring application so i'm using uh, spring session and uh, hazelcast is an implementation for spring session and uh, for change data capture, we will be using Debezium in the recovery. So here is a deployment diagram using UML. Um, so I have my blue database, I have my green database. I will create the job that reads from the blue database and writes to the green database. And here I have a container that run this job using several components. So first, uh, the JET API, the Agile Cost API, that under the cover uses the Bezium, and the Bezium itself under the cover uses the MySQL connector. The good thing with this approach is imagine here, you don't need to have MySQL, you might have Postgres. So you can also use it not only uh, to uh, deploy a new version of your application, keeping the exact same infrastructure, but you uh, can uh, like upgrade your architecture using new components as long as you've got the connector that uh, is adapted to you. So I've talked a lot already uh, and I believe that it's worthless if I don't show you how it works in practice. So let's see how we can do that. Here I have created my application. As I mentioned, it's a, it's, it's a Spring Boot application. Um, I will be using um, like Spring Data GPA to access the database. I will be using Spring Web uh, to have uh, controllers. For the pages, for the front end, I'm not a <laughs> front end developer. So I will be using all technologies. So I will generate pages server sites. As I mentioned, I'm using um, Spring Session and it's as all cost implementation. And uh, for uh, the um, for it to work on Kubernetes, I just need to add this as all cost Kubernetes so that uh, the networking pause port is taken care of. I've created this application. I've also what I, I also did is um, I created um, um, sorry. Um, Docker container out of it uh, using jib because again I'm pretty lazy so I want everything to be taken care of so uh, now I can just call uh, mvn com google cloud tools uh, double column jib maven plugin and it will create a docker container and this is already has already been uh, preloaded into my local decode daemon because otherwise it would take uh, too long so here I just need to do uh, the deployment. I've created such a deployment, it's here. So cube and there is this application. Um, so this is very simple. I've created the namespace, it has already been created. I've created a service and I've created a deployment with three replicas just 
as in my previous diagrams. And then um, I will deploy this uh, Hazel cost shop 1.0. And because I'm using Spring Boot, I have already uh, created some liveness prop and readiness prop and start prop. Here, there is some configuration to override them from um, for Spring Boot. And let, let's do it. So here I will deploy this. I've aliased kubectl to k because, again, I prefer uh, laziness. And uh, so I will do k apply dash f infrastructure application uh, cube slash application cube slash infrastructure whoops it will work at some point application.yaml and now we can watch how it gets deployed get parts w so i already pre prepared the database because here the database is not that interesting and it might take some time until all the pods are ready so let's do some magic Okay, this is looking good. So we can try. And let's say local hosts and it's this port. Now you can see why I'm a developer and not a designer. So I didn't want it to be too complicated. So instead of having an authentication layer uh, with Spring Session, actually we can just authenticate by uh, choosing our user. So here we have user Joe. So we will log in into the shop. And let's say user Joe uh, likes a Yeti mug. Now he has a Yeti mug. Now we can mock so that there is another user coming in and of course their cart is completely empty so we can add two t-shirts just like mine then we can do that the same with William and we will at the end check that uh, every user at uh, uh, after migration have everything in their cart so have a really we will give uh, them like four stickers so it will be easier to remember. So like one, two, three, four. We can go, go back to Joe and um, add some more stuff. And now imagine the other users, they don't do anything with their card. This user will just continue adding stuff to their card. So we will uh, like mock somebody who is interacting with the shop and mock people who are not interacting with the shop. Here, you can see a um, version of the pod of the deploy pod and here you can say the, uh, you can see the pod's name so this is um this is asynchronous so every time i do a change uh, i will need to refresh it explicitly to explicitly get this uh like normally so here i will first need to deploy the new database so let's deploy the new database okay apply F infrastructure cube. Uh, so it's a green. Okay, get pods W. So this is pretty quick. Just let's check the logs. Okay, logs green. Uh, dash F. So we will wait a bit, but it is very, 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 very uh, fast. This is MySQL. You can use Postgres, you can use a lot of different databases, so it has worked. So now what I want to do is I want to deploy the streaming job to every time I get a change from the green database to replicate through, through the blue database. So K apply, whoops, apply, dash F, um, infrastructure, Q for work. Here, k okay, get pods w, and I will show you the code because this one is interesting actually. This is also very very straightforward. I'm just using the Azelcast API and its integration with 
Debezium and MySQL. And because I want to write to another database, in this case, I want to write to the uh, green database, I want to, uh, I need a driver, a dedicated driver. And the code is the following. It's very small. So here I have the main class. And I, as you can see, it's not a framework. Actually, I just need a main method that will be my entry point. And inside, we need to define a pipeline. And the pipeline is actually close to like English. You read from the blue environment and we will add the ingestion timestamp and we will map the change record. This is what the object that we get every time there is a change. We will get its value because there is a header and there is a value. And then that we will like explode it to a map. And then we will get this map and change it to call parameters. And the call parameters is just the ID that uh, we get important stuff like customer ID, product ID, and quantity, which basically makes up the stuff that is in the court. And afterwards, we write to the green environment. And writing to the green environment is actually, again, very straightforward, a lot of configuration, and something that calls insert card line. And here, insert card line, if you are an old Java developer like me, you will remember this stuff. We are just like calling a printer statement. So I already have the printer statement, insert card line ready in my database, but of course you can do anything you want. And I will just pass the parameters that I've get that I've gotten. So customer ID, product ID, and quantity. So now it has been deployed. We will just check the logs, get logs before it. And you see that um, not only we are listening to the changes that uh, will happen, but we are also aware of the change that already happened before. So now on the green database, uh, the cards are already filled in. And if we do dash F, to listen to new stuff. Every time we will uh, like interact with the card, we will change, we will update the database, and in turn, we will be listening to the change here, customer ID 1, and that is Joe product ID 1, that is the Yeti mug and quantity 6. This is exactly what we have now. So now the green database is like in sync with the blue one. Every, every time there is a change, it is replicated. Now it's time to do the rolling update. So let's do it. K apply dash F infrastructure cube application two. And the only difference with application two is that it has, um, like it, it, it has been designed to cope with the new schema. And meanwhile, I will uh, try to interact with uh, the application and to show you that it still is able to work. Uh, I need also to check uh, get pod w that it's actually deploying something just to be aware because it's sometimes it might be so transparent that as, as a demo, I might not be aware of it. So depending on where you stand, it might be the most boring part or the most interesting part. Uh, let's check normally I should have already gotten some new codes. So one of them on which one I am depends. It's the yes this one that's good so let's try to refresh to check that uh, it changed yes so now it changed the ports and but it got me on a port that is still on version 1.0 so that's not what i wanted i would have liked uh, a version 2.0 but it's still working and again a bit of patience so it's 26, it's terminating. 
Uh, perhaps now I can refresh. The refreshing is just to check uh, the port version. Yes, I'm on version 2.0, so I, I was not aware of it. And of course, I can still continue adding stuff. Now the migration has been done. And uh, if we get back to Jack to see if they were upgraded correctly, yes, they had two items and William has uh, three hoodies. And of course, Avril should have four stitches. Yes, everything is working as expected. So I believe um, this is done. As I mentioned before, at this time, it could happen that there is an issue and we need to roll back. I didn't call the rollback, but the idea is just to have one single uh, like job. So you should first stop the forward job and you should do a backward job. It will be just the exact mirror of the first one. And that brings us to the end of the session. So I hope um, that in this talk I showed you a couple of takeaways that the first is a zero downtime is within your reach. Um, I did this talk before and I showed like the option one to have a single database. And given all the problems, I, I told people in the end, mm, okay, you can do zero downtime, but probably it will be very complicated. Uh, it will be very expensive. Just check whether it's worth it or, worth it or not. Um, with this second approach, I believe this is much more manageable uh, from an organizational point of view, from a technical point of view. And um, well, I think it's much easier to get zero downtime and to get the benefits and you don't need to invest that much. Um, there are two things to cope with when uh, you are um, deploying a new version of the application uh, and they are both related to state. The first one is sessions and here you saw that I didn't even show you the session because it's all taken care of by configuration. There is no code necessary again because this is uh, an old recipe. Session replication has been with us for a long time. And uh, the second is database state. This is much harder to cope with uh, but I hope that I show you that with uh, change data capture and data streaming, uh, you can achieve it. Thanks a lot for your attention. You can uh, read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter. If you are interested about the code, um, the code is readily available on Twitter. So if you want to see the whole of the code, which I couldn't do in such a small time frame, well, you are welcome. And yeah, if you have issues, um, just open pull request or whatever to improve it. Uh, if I got you interested in Hazelcast, again, though this talk is not about Hazelcast, join our Slack or get some free training. Again, have a very good day and see you soon.